Good evening, constant reader. Tonight, there is no supernatural creepiness, no tales of science fiction or terror, even though, to many, the name Stephen King is synonymous with horror, you and I both know better, Constant Reader, because we look to his stories and his books not just for the scary stuff, but for the full human experience, the darkness as well as the light, and one of the most breathtaking examples of blending tragedy and beauty is found in the short story, The Last Rung on the Ladder. I've written a lot of books about kids, which are what middle grade books really are or YA books are, but I refuse to call them that because let the kids find it on their own, that's all. When Stephen King writes about childhood, that's when I find myself relating to the material the most. Even though I've never been chased by an evil clown and I haven't even found a dead body in the woods. His stories rekindle so many memories from my past, despite the fact that he is writing about a different time and a very different region in the country. He grew up in Maine, and I grew up in Washington State. Of course, not all of Stephen King's stories take place in Maine. The last rung on the ladder takes place in Nebraska, 80 miles west of Omaha, in a town called Hemingford Home. Spoiler alert, I'm going to be reading some excerpts from this story and giving away some serious plot points. Much of this story takes place in the memories of our narrator as he recalls being a 10-year-old boy living on the farm. He and his sister have finished their chores for the day, and now it is time for them to play one of their favorite games. It's a game that they aren't supposed to be playing. It's a very dangerous stunt in the barn, 70 feet up in the air. Ten-year-old Larry and his eight-year-old sister Katrina, or Kitty, take turns climbing up a rickety ladder. Then they walk across a beam, over the hardwood floor, risking life and limb. And why do they do this? Because they want to experience the thrill of falling falling without the pain that usually comes from landing. Listen to this beautiful yet eerie passage. At last I stood above the safety of the hay. Now looking down was not so much frightening as sensual. There was a moment of anticipation. Then I stepped off into space, holding my nose for effect, and as it always did, the sudden grip of gravity yanking me down brutally, making me plummet, made me feel like yelling, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, let me back up. Then I hit the hay, shot into it like a projectile, its sweet and dusty smell billowing up around me, still going down as if into heavy water, coming slowly to rest buried in the stuff. As always, I could feel a sneeze building up in my nose and hear a frightened field mouse or two fleeing for the more serene section of the haymow and feel, in that curious way, that I had been reborn. I remember Kitty telling me once that after diving into the hay, she felt fresh and new, like a baby. I shrugged it off at the time, sort of knowing what she meant, sort of not knowing. But since I got her letter, I think about that too. Constant Reader, did you have those daredevil types of experiences during your childhood? Perhaps it wasn't in a barn, but maybe it was something similar? On our channel's community page, I asked our fellow subscribers, what was the riskiest thing you ever did for fun as a child? And here are some of their answers. One of our constant readers says, We used to climb up an old abandoned overpass in the woods, 
holes in the middle of it, and all covered in rusty rebar sticking out every which way. No one ever died, but looking back, it was quite the possibility. Another constant reader says this, At five years old, another neighbor boy, who is six, at the time, convinced me to walk out the back door of my house and go on an adventure. Several hours later, the police were looking for us, and my sister found us in a cow pasture trying to pet a bull. For me, I recall a certain train trestle in eastern Washington. My cousin and I would climb all the way up to the top, and then we would walk across. The Yakima River was below us, and at the time, I thought that if we tripped and fell, the water would save us. But now, as an adult, I know that the shallow river, only three feet deep or so, would not have spared us from breaking our bones. When we're young, most of us believe our life is charmed, that we are invincible, and that if your sister is in trouble, you can save the day. This is similar to how Larry springs into action when the ladder falls apart and poor Katrina is dangling from the last rung on the ladder. In this situation, if she falls, she will most certainly die. So Larry frantically covers the hardwood floor of the barn with as much hay as he can move, hoping that it will be enough to break her fall. His actions save her life. She's only slightly injured, and the children are in trouble with the parents, but the crisis is averted. A life is saved, at least for the time being. When the story transitions back to adulthood, we learn that Katrina has grown into a broken, tormented soul. Unable to face the weariness of the world, she steps off the ledge of a building and ends it all. Before she does this, she writes to her brother a cry for help, just one sentence that reads, Dear Larry, I've been thinking about it a lot lately, and what I've decided is that it would have been better for me if that last rung had broken before you could put the hay down. We can't always save the ones we love. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we're just in time to break their fall. And sometimes it's too late. Sometimes we don't realize that the person we look up to is just hanging on barely holding on to the last rung on the ladder. But I promised you beauty from Stephen King's story instead of just all this sadness at the end. And we can find it in the middle. Listen to this. This is when Kitty, or Katrina, is about to jump into the hay. High down there, high up there, she edged along the beam and my heart loosened a little in my chest when I judged she was over the safety of the hay. It always did, although she was always more graceful than I was, and more athletic, if that doesn't sound too strange a thing to say about your kid sister. She stood, poising on the toes of her old low-topped keds, hands out in front of her, and then she swanned. Talk about things you can't forget, things you can't describe. Well, I can describe it, in a way, but not in a way that will make you understand how beautiful that was, how perfect, one of the few things in my life that seem utterly real, utterly true. No, I can't tell you like that. I don't have the skill with either my pen or my tongue. For a moment, she seemed to hang in the air, as if borne up by one of those mysterious updrafts that only existed in the third loft. A bright swallow with golden plumage such as Nebraska has never seen. She was Kitty, my sister. Her arms swept behind her and her back arched. And how I loved her for that beat of time. Then she came down, 
and plowed into the hay and out of sight. An explosion of chaff and giggles rose out of the hole she made. Thank you for watching and listening, fellow constant reader. And as always, thank you to Mr. Stephen King for his decades of storytelling.